So I want to talk a little bit about uh, Occupy and what's happened in the country. Um, but in order to get there, I want to talk around some of the themes that I looked at in a book I wrote called Death of the Liberal Class. And um, the book had a funny kind of genesis. Uh, it began as a book about the press. Um, Kanaf had asked me to write it. Um, and it was, a, it was the first time I'd had a publisher come and suggest an idea to me. It's a really good lesson for writers in the room. Never write anybody else's idea. Um, and I finished the manuscript uh, and turned it in, and Kanaf hated it. Um, they objected to my critique of uh, the uh, mainstream media. Um, they uh, called it negativity which they volunteered to uh, assign an editor to excise all of the negativity, and then they would publish it. Well, of course, that's the mythic version of the press. I mean, I actually think that the decline of the traditional press is catastrophic for our democracy, and yet at the same time, I'm, I'm not about to hide its many deficiencies. I spent 15 years at the New York Times, where on the front page it says all the news that fit to print, um, I can tell you that the uh, unofficial and far more correct credo of the New York Times is uh, do not significantly alienate those on whom we depend for money and access. <laughs> um, sometimes you'll do it, uh, but reporters who kept pushing uh, became management problems uh, and got uh, shoved out of the newsroom. Sidney Shanberg, some of you may know, they made the movie The Killing Fields around Sydney. Uh, came back from Cambodia, uh, was on the Metro desk, and started going after real estate developers uh, who happened to be close personal friends of the publisher, and that was the end of Sydney's career. Uh, David Halberstam, uh, uh, Ray Bonner, I mean, there's a long list. If you push too hard uh, on these issues, if you care ultimately about truth uh, a little more than your career, you don't tend to last at these places. Uh, and yet, they're reality-based news organizations, and with the rise of the cable news networks, uh, in, you know, like Fox, etc., uh, what's terrifying is that uh, we are uh, creating a system of information where you can believe whatever you want to believe, where lies are true. Um, uh, the, whatever the deficiencies of the times, and there were many, it was a newspaper, or is a newspaper, that remains rooted in verifiable fact. Uh, you go out, you seek out a story, you seek out information, um, it's vetted, it's edited, and it's printed. Not that we didn't make mistakes, but we tried very hard not to. Uh, and all of that is going with the death of newsprint. Uh, the commercial airwaves have been, I think at this point, uh, destroyed. Uh, the, uh, what passes for the nightly news on the three major networks is truly terrifying. Uh, celebrity gossip and uh, you know, uh, feel-good stories, and um, it's just abominable. And when you remember back, as I do when I began, what, uh, what was there, uh, with, and it had limitations, but at least they, 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 they were, had foreign bureaus, they, had, they reported stories, they uh, had producers, they produced three to five minute pieces, they put it on the nightly air, all of that is gone. Um, and so uh, when Kanaf decided that they would rewrite my book for me, I uh, f went around and found, uh, started hunting for a publisher anywhere that would take it. Uh, I, they had paid me half the advance. It's uh, when you get an advance on a book, you usually get 50%. Uh, and then when you turn in the manuscript, you get the, uh, the rest of it. And so I got Nation Books to pay the money that Kanaf had paid me um, to buy the book. Um, and I, in that transition period, uh, realized that the press hardly existed in a vacuum, that all of the pillars of the liberal establishment had collapsed, including the liberal church, which I come out of, um, labor, which of course has been decimated, uh, public education, I mean, City University of New York used to be one of the great universities in this country. It provided a first class education to uh, uh, you know, generations of immigrants, it's gone. Um, and 
uh, culture, which has been completely commercialized. Uh, the uh, um, system of public education at the lower levels, uh, all of it's been under assault. So it wasn't just the, the press that had been degraded, um, but, but all of those columns by which a liberal democratic society functions. And the question was why? How did it happen? How did we get here? And I think it, 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 it for me, uh, began in uh, World War I. Uh, Dwight MacDonald, who's a writer some of you may know, uh, who I admire immensely, uh, he, for five years, um, uh, he's, I'm actually related to him, and at one point my family had money, and he married into to it and used all the money he got from his wife to run a, a journal in which he lost a ton every year called Politics for five years, uh, which if you know about Chomsky, Chomsky talks about politics as being that uh, publication that uh, created his political awakening. And um, it's a wonderful example, never had a circulation above 5,000, but it's a wonderful example of the power of ideas. Um, that it's not the numbers you reach, it's who you reach. And he published Orwell and Hannah Arendt uh, and Betelheim, it was really quite a journal. Um, he was a really beautiful writer, wrote for the New Yorker, um, was an anarchist, was briefly a Trotskyite, um, until Trotsky expelled him from the party after reading uh, Dwight MacDonald's uh, writings in the Trotskyite newspaper in New York. He actually mailed a letter from Mexico uh, that said everyone has a right to their own stupidities, but Comrade MacDonald abuses the privilege. Um, I also like him because he wrote some wonderful literary essays. One of the greatest essays on Joyce uh, I've read was written by MacDonald. I mean, he had that kind of breadth that I like very much. He cared as much about culture as he did about politics. Um, and MacDonald writes of uh, World War I that it was the rock on which progressive movements broke. And he's right. Because on the eve of World War I, uh, we had powerful progressive movements in this country. Uh, remember in 1912, Eugene Debs, the socialist candidate, uh, converted to socialism in prison after taking part in the Pullman uh, railroad worker strike where he was sent to jail, reads Marx's Das Kapital, becomes a socialist. He pulls 900,000 votes or 6% of the vote. Uh, we have publications like The Masses, uh, Appeal to Reason, uh, which had the fourth highest circulation of any publication in the country, a socialist journal, The Wobblies, uh, the old CIO, um, and, uh, and the power elite was, was, was frightened. We had about three dozen socialist mayors in this country, including in cities like Schenectady and Milwaukee, other cities. And what happened was that uh, towards the end of the war, and Wilson had run for re-election uh, with the slogan, he kept us out of the war. Uh, there was no popular support for this war at all. Uh, but with the collapse of the Eastern Front uh, and Tsarist Russia um, and the rise of the Bolsheviks, uh, it, it raised the possibility of the Germans being able to transfer about 100 divisions to the Western Front, which uh, would have probably meant the defeat of the British and the French. And American bankers in Wall Street had lent tremendous sums of money to the British and the French governments. Uh, which they realized that if the war was lost would not be repaid. And a lot of the slogans, the anti-war slogans, uh, were very conscious at the time uh, that this was a war being fought on behalf of Wall Street. Um, the Kaiser certainly assisted the war effort by trying to impose a naval blockade around Britain, uh, which sank, I think, three American merchant ships. So Wilson enters the war uh, and uh, there's very little support for this war. They, they, they very quickly have to institute a draft because uh, people are just not volunteering to serve. And you get the creation of, at this moment, the first system of modern mass propaganda. Uh, the, public, the Committee for Public Information or the Creel Commission because it was headed by a former muckraker named George Creel. 
um, and the sort of grand inquisitorial figure uh, of the intellectual class, it turns out at this moment to be Walter Lippmann. His book, Public Opinion, becomes a kind of blueprint for how, in his words, a term, phrase that Chomsky uses later when he writes his book, how you manufacture consent. And for the first time, you have a system of modern mass propaganda that understands that people are not moved by fact or reason, but by the manipulation of emotion. Um, it draws on the understanding of mass or crowd psychology by Le Bon, Trotter, and Sigmund Freud. Out of the Committee for Public Information comes Edward Bernays, the father, father of the modern public relations industry. Bernays' book, Propaganda, written after the war, becomes one of the seminal texts that Goebbels uses when he establishes the Nazi propaganda machine. Um, you had all of the mechanisms of the state deployed to carry out this system of propaganda, including a film division in Hollywood that would make movies like uh, The Kaiser, The Butcher of Berlin. Uh, you had speakers bureaus, they called them Three Minute Men, 45,000 people go, fanned out around the country. Uh, you had its own news division that printed daily uh, all sorts of pro-war stories uh, that had to be published in the papers. We had a much more diversified press at the turn of the century. It wasn't as consolidated as it is now. And if you did not editorially support the war, you were not allowed to publish. Uh, so the masses shuts down, appeal to reason, um, uh, publishes pro-war editorials. And what's fascinating is how effective that propaganda is. And if you want an, a window into how uh, powerful uh, propaganda can be, read Randolph Bourne or Jane Addams two great radicals who held out. And, and they're constantly lamenting uh, that all of their socialist comrades uh, and colleagues uh, have been seduced by the war effort, the war propaganda. And in fact, uh, you know, this was at the beginning, uh, Wilson wanted the harsher measures of control that he could employ through the Sedition Act and the Espionage Act. And the argument of Lippmann was that through a system of mass propaganda, uh, they would only have to use those harsher measures of control selectively. And that is precisely what's happened. Uh, Debs, of course, ends up in prison uh, for denouncing the war. Um, but it was very rare that the uh, sort of iron fist of the state had to intercede. The propaganda was that effective. And and MacDonald, when he writes about this period, said what happened immediately when the war was over was that we entered a kind of a culture of permanent war. Uh, because the moment the war ended, the dreaded Hun was replaced with the dreaded Red. Indeed, to make the transition, uh, the propagandists spun out uh, a story about how it was the Germans that had funded the Bolsheviks and the Russian Revolution. Clearly there was collaboration, you know, they let Lenin and was about 160 Bolsheviks from Switzerland go on a seal train through Germany uh, into Russia. Um, uh, and, and McDonald says, well, there was n all of the political and social uh, theorists of the 19th century, none of them anticipated, including Marx, this idea of permanent war, this psychosis of permanent war where you're constantly looking for the internal enemy. And it's immediately after the war that you see the sort of residue of radical publications and movements get squashed. That's when the Wobblies get squashed. Um, of course, Joe Hill, a uh, union organizer, gets uh, hung in Utah on trumped up murder charges. Uh, Big Bill Haywood, another uh, leader of the Wobblies, uh, they, another uh, sort of uh, uh, falsified charge of, of murder, he flees the country, and Big Bill Haywood spends the last 10 years of his life in exile in Moscow. You have uh, Emma Goldman and uh, Alexander Berkman and about 300 other radicals deported to Russia. Um, the masses is shut down, appeal to reason, even though they, were, they took pro-war uh, editorial stances throughout the conflict, is shut down. Uh, the Palmer raids, um, and that began 
the power elite's assault against popular and radical movements. Now, in any functioning democracy, uh, the liberal establishment is not designed to be the political center. I mean, political left. It's designed to be the political center. And I think Chomsky has done a pretty good job of defining what the role of the liberal class is. That it acts as a kind of safety valve that makes possible incremental and piecemeal reform when there are disruptions in the society and grievances and injustices. So that in the New Deal, you have a liberal establishment under Roosevelt um, that responds to the massive unemployment uh, and poverty uh, by creating programs. And when Conrad Black wrote his biography of Roosevelt, he said that Roosevelt's greatest achievement was that he saved capitalism. And I think that's right. That's what a liberal class does. It sets the parameters of debate so that one can critique the excesses, for instance, of capitalism, but one can't critique capitalism itself. Um, and all of those who step outside the boundaries set by the liberal class become pariahs. So uh, these assaults against popular movements uh, uh, were accompanied by, of course, uh, the Red Scare and witch hunts, uh, which culminated in the 1950s with the McCarthy hearings uh, and uh, the purging of thousands of intellectuals, professors, journalists, artists, writers uh, from the mainstream society. I taught at the University of Toronto uh, a year ago fall and uh, met, spent time with a guy named Chandler Davis who was one of the great, uh, great mathematicians of this country who got caught up in the Red Scare, actually went to prison for six months, fled to Toronto, at the university, has taught the, the university there for the rest of his life and never came back. Um, many people were not fortunate enough to get uh, employment. Um, social work unions were decimated. Social workers used to advocate on behalf of their clients. Um, and so with the destruction of the radical movements and a disemboweling of the liberal class itself, witch hunts inside the ACLU, um, uh, you know, journalists like I.F. Stone, probably our greatest investigative journalist becomes a pariah. He can't even get a job at The Nation magazine. Uh, we, we lost pressure. Some of you laugh, and I know why. Um, we lost that uh, pressure uh, from, from populist forces that had always been the correctives within American democracy. All of, every, all of the changes, I mean, if you go back and look at uh, the way governance was constituted uh, by the founding fathers, uh, they were terrified of popular rule, and they installed numerous mechanisms to prevent popular rule. Of course, uh, huge segments of the American population were utterly disenfranchised from the start. Not only Native Americans, African Americans, women, uh, indentured servants, uh, people without property. It was always a white, wealthy elite um, because of his speculation in Indian lands. By the time Washington became president, he was the wealthiest person in the United States. And um, uh, all, all, American history, and Zinn you know, writes about this really well, has been a struggle by these forces to open up that democracy. It's been a constant struggle to open it up. Uh, labor unions, without question, created the middle class in this country. Uh, and with the decimation of these populist forces, uh, you know, none of which achieved formal positions of power. The Liberty Party that fought slavery, or the suffragists, or the labor movement, or the civil rights movement. Although, by 1968, Martin Luther King was probably the most powerful uh, figure in the United States, because when he went to Memphis, or uh, uh, Selma, 50,000 people went with him. Uh, and with the destruction against these radical movements and the weakening of the liberal class. What we lost were the impediments against a rapacious corporate capitalism. And uh, it began probably with the Taft-Hartley Act. I mean, every uh, achievement of the New Deal was rolled back. Um, the last one probably being uh, in 1999, given to us by Lawrence Summers with the destruction of Glass-Steagall, uh, which uh, 
protected our banking system. There is no banking crisis in Canada because Chrétien did not tear down the firewalls between commercial and investment banks. Um, and by the early 1970s, in the words of the Harvard historian Charles Mayer, we began to shift from what he called an empire of production to an empire of consumption, which meant that we started to uh, borrow to maintain both a lifestyle and an empire we could no longer afford. Uh, we saw the uh, decimation of the manufacturing base in this country uh, and the ability of global corporations to create a kind of worldwide neo-feudalism. There was actually a pretty good story in the New York Times a few days ago about the conditions of workers in China who make uh, Apple products. Um, and, and what happens is the American worker is now told that they have to be competitive in a global marketplace, which means that they have to be competitive with sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who make 22 cents an hour or prison labor in China. Uh, and uh, in that two-part series in the Times, they quote uh, Steve Jobs uh, when Obama asks him why and there's between uh, sort of subsidiaries of Apple, the 700,000 people are employed, why uh, those, some of those jobs can't come back and Jobs apparently curtly answered those jobs are never coming back. Um, so we, we lost our radical movements, our liberal institutions were, uh, were weak, severely weakened, um, that's how figures like Henry Wallace, Roosevelt's vice president, 1948, runs for president himself, is tarred with being soft on communism. Um, you know, it's the tactic that Nixon used quite effectively, whether against Helen Cahagla Douglas or, uh, uh, you know, um, other candidates, uh, including, of course, McGovern. Uh, it becomes a way of uh, shutting out uh, anybody with a conscience, anybody who uh, seeks any kind of redress to the rising social inequities um, that are taking place in the country. Uh, manufacturing starts to leave. Uh, you have uh, a huge rise in deficits. Of course, now we have, the, I think, the largest deficits in human history, which we can't repay. Uh, and uh, for me, you know, one of the sort of low points in American history comes with the arrival of Bill Clinton. Uh, Clinton, who uh, speaks that traditional language of that feel your pain language of liberalism, but assiduously serves the interests of corporations. Uh, and that becomes the template for the new liberal. Um, the words don't in any way match the actions. So it's Clinton that shoves through NAFTA the greatest betrayal of the working class in this country since Taft-Hartley. It's Clinton that destroys welfare. It's Clinton that deregulates the FCC so Clear Channel and Rupert Murdoch's News Corp can buy up. I think Clear Channel runs 1,500 radio stations across the country. Uh, it's it's uh, a Clinton that deregulates the banking system under Larry Summers. Um, and like Obama, Clinton is, uh, you know, certainly knows where the centers of power lie. Uh, and by the 1990s, the, the Democratic Party has fundraising parity with the Republicans, and by the time Obama runs for president in 2004, the Democrats are getting more. So, um, 2008, right? Yeah, 2008. And um, uh, we see within the establishment a system cemented into place by corporations uh, that cross party lines and that finally make it impossible for uh, citizens' voices to be heard. Ro uh, John Ralston Saul, who's a uh, Canadian philosopher who I like very much, wrote a very good book called Voltaire's Bastards, um, calls it a coup d'etat in slow motion. And I think that's right. I think that's what we underwent. Um, and you, you end up with a system uh, and of course, I think that system is finally, it, 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 if democracy sort of had a final moment, it would have been uh, in January 2010 with Citizens United. Um, it's not that corporate money weren't coming, wasn't coming into the system before, but now there were no, no restrictions left on corporate money, and that money could be used anonymously, and it was in today, in the Times, uh, Obama talks 
uh, or there's an article about how Obama is trying to get donors to uh, give money to the su Democratic super PAC, something Obama said he would never do. Uh, because if uh, th those super PACs now are so powerful that if you don't pay fealty to corporate interests, um, you know you can be destroyed. And so um, every piece of legislation that the fossil fuel industry or uh, the pharmaceutical industry wants passed gets passed. It's how uh, the Obama health care bill ends up being 2,000 pages written by corporate lobbyists. Um, the equivalent of the bank bailout bill to the pharmaceutical and insurance industry, $400 billion in subsidies, um, no caps on um, co-pays and premiums which can be raised against the elderly or against those who are so sick that they've lost their work. Um, you know, in moral terms, it, we, we now live in a country where it is legally permissible for corporations to hold sick people hostage while their parents bankrupt themselves trying to save their sons or daughters. That's what the corporate state. Co corporate capitalism unfettered is a revolutionary force. Marx was right. Uh, there's a wonderful book by Carl Polyani called The Great Transformation, written in 1944, about unfettered capitalism. He, he's an interesting, it's a really great book. I mean, he actually uses the word sacred. He said, when societies lose the capacity for the sacred, when nothing has an intrinsic value, when everything becomes a commodity, then corporations will exploit those commodities, whether it's human beings or the natural world, until exhaustion or collapse. And built within that system of unregulated, unfettered capitalism is self-annihilation, because there are no limits. The book that I'm writing, I spent two years on, which will be out in June, I'm doing with a great graphic illustrator named Joe Sacco, um, so 50 pages of it are drawn. Um, but we, were, we, worked, we worked out of the poorest pockets of the United States. These sacrifice zones, including Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States, along with southern West Virginia, and some of you may have been to southern West Virginia, we, when you fly over it, um, we are um, blasting uh, the Appalachian Mountains uh, into uh, toxic heaps of rubble. Um, because coal companies don't want to burrow down anymore, um, they'll just knock the top 400 feet off of mountains. Uh, all of that carcinogens poisons the streams, poisons the air. We were in towns in southern West Virginia where every single person in that town, including the children, had their gallbladders removed. Um, cancer is absolutely epidemic. Um, you can't drive more than two hours uh, on the roads in southern West Virginia, we had to carry Windex and big rolls of paper towels because by the, by after two hours, the whole back of the window is black. And you have to just clean. People breathe in this stuff. Um, there is no limit. There are no impediments, as Dan Bergen says. The only word corporations know, understand, is more. And uh, I think we have to make a distinction between Penny capitalism, which the capitalism of the farmers in the town in upstate New York where I grew up, who bring their produce in and sell it. Regional capitalism, which is the hardware store owner or the small business owner, and corporate capitalism, which is a radical force and which is supranational. It has no loyalty to the nation state. You know, as Ralph Nader told me recently, why doesn't anybody call these people for what they are, which are traitors? Um, they are quite happy to destroy and disembowel the country, which they are doing, uh, for corporate profit. So with the destruction of the manufacturing base, you get the rise of a class of speculators embodied you know, by institutions such as Goldman Sachs. Speculators in the 17th century were hung. Speculation was a crime. It was a capital crime. Uh, today, of course, they not only run the economy, but run the government. Uh, and uh, there's a really good book by... Matt Taibbi, Griftopia. Um, I don't know how anybody can write so well about a subject that is so obtuse, but he does. Um, and uh, you know, he makes a really good point in that book that, that, that there are really two sets of laws now um, for the elite, for corporations like Goldman Sachs, which are bailed out with taxpayer money and then given virtually interest-free loans uh, by the government 
after they're bailed out. I, I'm not sure what you call it. I don't think it's capitalism. I don't know what the right word for it is. Um, and then there's the laws for the rest of us. And that we fail to see those distinctions. That the intrusion of regulations and laws for the small business owner for us is a nuisance and often an impediment. Uh, but on the upper levels, they write the laws. Um, they get whatever they want. Uh, and, uh, and I think that you know, there's just one piece of legislation after another that illustrates that. Um, the FISA Reform Act being one of the most egregious. The FISA Reform Act, which uh, retroactively makes legal what under our Constitution has traditionally been illegal, the warrantless wiretapping, monitoring, and eavesdropping of tens of millions of American citizens. And the reason it was retroactive is because you had large telecommunication companies like AT&T and Verizon and Sprint turn over tens of millions of uh, records of American citizens to the government. And th those, uh, that intrusion into privacy was being challenged and working its way up in the lower courts, uh, and they knew they'd lose. And so they, that's why they put the retroactive measure in. Uh, and of course, lobbyists descended on Washington uh, with uh, generous amounts of campaign contributions, and everybody uh, folded, including Obama, who said that he would filibuster it, came back and voted for it. Um, and so as all of the traditional impediments by which we protected ourselves were erased, you had this kind of snowballing effect uh, where the crimes of the corporate state uh, became increasingly egregious and harder and harder to ignore. Um, they did a very good job and have done a very good job with spectacle, with uh, entertainment, with the tawdry, um, you know, the, the collapse of dying empires, uh, whether it's the Austro-Hungarian Empire or the Ottoman Empire or even the Roman Empire, they always descend into these kind of twilight periods, and Cicero writes about it, uh, where it's all about spectacle and, and violence and sex. And Cicero actually writes about how, you know, at this point you're seeing the rise of figures like Nero and Caligula. And, and he's saying, you know, Romans just go to the Colosseum and they invest their emotional and intellectual life in, in, uh, in entertainment, which became vaster and vaster and vaster. You know, 2,000 uh, slaves uh, battling it out to uh, replicate the sacking of Carthage. I mean, it became quite immense, the spectacle. Uh, and I don't think it's accidental that in the Civil War, Cicero became a deeply detested figure because he spoke a very uncomfortable truth to power. And he's actually, in the middle of the Civil War, is hunted down by Mark Anthony, uh, who's, who uh, decapitates him and cuts off his hands. And they bring Cicero's severed head and his hands to the Colosseum, and they say he will never speak or write again, and 40,000 people roar their approval. Um, that's what happens when societies die. Uh, and I wrote a book a few years ago called Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle, that looks about how illusioned our society has become. Uh, and I think one of the most pernicious forms of illusion is this mantra that is fed to us across the political and cultural spectrum that says that we can have everything we want. That reality is never an impediment to what we desire. Um, that if we focus on happiness, if we dig deep enough within ourselves, if we grasp that we are truly exceptional, if we believe in Jesus, uh, it, but it's magical thinking. And it's fed to us by Oprah, it's fed to us by the Christian right, it's fed to us by Hollywood. Uh, and what it does is essentially leave a populace reduced to, in a state of infantilism, um, where you never grow up. Uh, but as that gap opens up between the illusion of who we think we are and where we're going and the reality, when it's our home that is foreclosed, when we go bankrupt because of medical bills, when we realize that that job uh, that we lost is not only not coming back, but that good job will never be there for our children, then those who are kept in a state of infantilism react like infants, which is to cry for a demagogue or a charismatic leader or a savior for moral renewal and new glory. 
uh, and I uh, think the Tea Party has uh, elements within it that can adequately or accurately be described as fascist. Um, they uh, focus on the vulnerable within the society. Uh, of course, there's a very dark undercurrent, a kind of coded racism towards African Americans, a uh, very overt racism towards Muslims, uh, a hatred of undocumented workers, uh, homophobia, a celebration of the language of violence, a celebration of the gun culture, and, um, and I think part of the failure of the liberal establishment is that their anger towards that liberal class, that traditional liberal class that speaks in the language of empathy and yet has failed them, uh, means that their sense of betrayal is not misplaced. But unfortunately, their hatred towards self-identified liberals brings with it a hatred of traditional liberal values as well. Um, when we, when Sacco and I began the book, we gave it the title Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt. Um, now, revolt was conjecture when we began it two years ago. And of course, in September of this year, we saw the rise of the Occupy movement, uh, which I think what's fascinating, what's fascinating for me about the Occupy movement, I, they probably don't like to think of themselves like this, is that they're a mainstream movement. In this sense, if you look at the opinion polls, most Americans, a majority of Americans, agree on the fundamental issues that are raised with the Occupy movement. Whether that's about the malfeasance of Wall Street, whether it's about our never-ending imperial wars, uh, whether it is about the failure to create a jobs program, um, and if you go on the Occupy DC website, they've actually that all the statistics are there on all of the major issues. And the danger of this movement for the power elite was that it is a mainstream movement. It articulated um, concerns and issues that swept across uh, class lines, political lines, and racial lines. And for the power elite, and let's be clear who the power elite is, it's Lloyd Blankfein and Robert Rubin and all these guys. This was truly terrifying. Uh, and it was really terrifying for the Democratic Party. And let's not remember that all of these occupying encampments were shut down by a Democratic president uh, who publicly has kept silent about Occupy, but there's no question, certainly with the shutdown of those 18 encampments, that that was a coordinated national effort done by the Obama administration. And it was done because Occupy called the Democrats out for who they were. And um, and for that reason, the movement was dangerous. So for me, when they, on that, when they shut those 18 encampments down, that was a kind of seminal moment for me because it was an illustration of how tone deaf the corporate state is, how out of touch they are. There's a kind of Versailles quality, forbidden city quality to our elite who, because they're so wealthy, have just utterly severed themselves from the mainstream. I think a, a New York, I think it was a New Yorker writer who said that these people don't live in America, they live in Richistan. Um, <laughs> and so they thought they would physically erase these encampments. Now, all of the issues that push people into these encampments, of course, are not only still there, but getting worse. If they were astute, if we had a kind of Roosevelt, Henry Wallace, New Deal, classical liberal power elite still within the structures of power, they would have immediately forgiven the $1 trillion in student debt they would have called a moratorium on foreclosures and bank repossessions, and they would have spent a trillion dollars on a job program especially targeted to people under the age of 25. And instead, by trying to shut it down, um, that was, I think, for me, an indication of how woefully out of touch they are with the suffering that is sweeping across the United States. And of course, you know, all you have to do is go back and look at what the U.S. government did to radical movements in the 1960s 
as a kind of template for what they're doing now. Um, they try to physically remove them and internally destroy them. Uh, and I wrote a column that um, did not endear me to black bloc anarchists um, on Monday, calling the black bloc the cancer of the Occupy movement. Uh, they use the Occupy movement as a kind of cover uh, to carry out acts of petty vandalism uh, and embrace a kind of repellent cynicism uh, that they confuse with revolution. Um, and I can assure you that the corporate state could not be happier. Um, you know, every sort of example of what the movement should not become can be found on what the New York Post says it is. Um, if you read, read the New York Post in all of those days before they shut the encampment down, it was just vicious, hate-filled, fabricated propaganda. And, um, and any step you take however inadvertently to fulfilling that vision, uh, all of the warning lights should go off. I have you know, no evidence that there are agents provocateurs inside the black bloc. I do know they were in Canada. We know because they testified against the people uh, after the G20, uh, but my guess is that's cer certainly where they would be. Um, and we saw, uh, you know, some, we've seen some uh, frightening trials uh, coming out of, for instance, the uh, protests at the last convention where uh, I think there's these two kids in Texas, I forget their names, who were completely set up uh, by a police agent. Um, it's such an old story. I mean, they're all but they're, you know, giving them the bottles with the gasoline and showing them how to stuff the rags in it. And the next thing you know, they spend 23 months in prison. Um, so, uh, uh, the movement's not going to go away. How will it manifest itself? No one knows. Um, I've covered enough movements to understand that they're kind of mysterious forces. I uh, was in uh, East Germany uh, for the um, overthrow of the East Term for Hanukkah and the East German government. Uh, you had mostly clergy out of Leipzig, candlelight vigils. You know, 100 people would show up, 70 people would show up, and then suddenly 20,000 people showed up. And then 70,000 people showed up. And then Honecker decided to send down an elite paratroop division to shoot them, and the paratroopers wouldn't shoot. And it was over. Honecker lasted another week after 19 years in power and was out. In Czechoslovakia, uh, it, it was the same, where uh, the, you pulled a half a million people into Vencela Square, um, and the foot soldiers of the elite finally would not carry out the forces of control that a corrupt and discredited uh, group uh, within the inner circle wanted carried out. Uh, that's how revolutions always happen. People forget that the Russian Revolution was a bloodless revolution, not on the part of, of the Cossacks and the Tsar and the Okra, but on the part of the people. On the abdication of the Tsar, there was no armed uprising to get the Czar to abdicate. What happened in the Russian Revolution, and Paul Avrich has written a very good book about this called The Russian Anarchists, is that all of those local Soviets, which were primarily anarchist in nature, which had risen up and were ruling Petrograd, and Lenin infiltrated them. Uh, there was uh, assassinations of large numbers of anarchist leaders. Uh, we don't know a lot about it because so many were killed. Uh, because he wanted centralized control, and then, of course, the Bolsheviks carry out an armed pooch. Um, against Kerensky and the cadets, um, not against the Tsar. The Tsar was gone. Um, and uh, you know, from my time in Eastern Europe, uh, I am convinced that this corp the corporate state, the corporate centers of power, are as corrupt and as rotten uh, as the regimes we saw in East Germany. How will it take place? How long will it happen? None of us can answer. In Poland, it took ten years. In East Germany, it took 10 weeks, and in Czechoslovakia, it took 10 days, and by the time I got to Romania, that guy was gone in four days. Um, we don't know. No one knows. Or even will it succeed? Um, there's no guarantee that it will succeed. Uh, it's got to be smart. It's got to be organized. It's got to be disciplined. It's got to be nonviolent, um, because as long as it continues to articulate those mainstream uh, sort of uh, complaints and, and suffering that has 
been inflicted on two thirds of this country. And as long as it is a movement that in a physical form is, makes that mainstream feel comfortable, um, then the power elite in this country is in, ex in really, really serious trouble. Um, I'll just finally end by saying that it is not accidental that our economic crisis is twinned with an environmental crisis. That when corporations are unleashed like this, um, they uh, will not only destroy human beings as commodities, but of course destroy the ecosystem for profit on which human beings depend for life. And if you read Jim Hansen or Bill McKibben or Clive Hamilton or anyone else who writes about uh, the climate crisis, um, you know, they're talking about a window of three or four years. We have very, very little time left. In theological terms, unfettered, unregulated corporate capitalism are systems of death. And I think that this resistance, as long as it remains nonviolent, um, as long as it, as it c continues to remain focused on the fundamental issue, which is corporate power, everything flows from corporate power whether it's the health insurance industry or the fossil fuel industry uh, or the war industry, um, it is breaking the back of the corporate state um, that gives us a possibility for life. Um, and if this movement does not succeed, uh, both economically and environmentally, um, I, I, fear, I fear for our future. Thank you. decision, I forget the exact year, there's probably a better German historian in the room than I. There were, I think it was uh, 1916 or 1917, he made a decision that all shipping, no matter where it was, to Britain would be sunk. In a way to sort of kind of star, you know, create a British blockade, which of course they tried to replicate in, in World War II. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the rallying cries to support the war was the fact that they sunk. Well, they got change. I mean, they defied SOPA. Um, I mean, the problem with defying the corporate state is that they o they're always going to come back at you again. It's like the XL pipeline. So Obama rejects it, and then the next day invites the Calgary-based company to resubmit their bid, which isn't a good sign. Um, they're hesitant in an election year to go too far. Um, but I, I don't have confidence that they'll stop. Um, I, don't, I don't know what the most recent thing, of, I've seen Anonymous, but I don't know what the most recent uh, posting Anonymous has is. Is there one that you're referring to in particular? Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, the that has proved very useful for providing alternative sources of information, but I would have to caution you that you have to be proactive to get it. And I think most Americans are passive consumers of information. Um, many of us in this room are probably proactive. We'll read the Guardian website or, uh, but uh, I, I think the danger of the internet is people tend to retreat into their intellectual ghettos. So, you know, if you're a birther, you go to birther sites. Uh, you know, if you're, if you want every American to carry an automatic weapon, you go to, autom I don't know, NRA sites or something. I, I think that, you know, that coming out of the old newspaper world is something that worries me because uh, when you, when you got a daily newspaper, you got a lot of stuff you didn't ask for. Um, there was a kind of democratic equality to information. I do uh, tend to think people ghettoize on the internet. I don't think the internet is a good organizing tool. I think it's a good communications tool. But in the end, I think again, Occupy showed us that there's no uh, replacement for getting out on the street. That's finally what we have to do. One, two, three, over here. Four. Thank you so much. That was wonderful to hear you. Um, and I uh, heard you when you spoke at the Occupy Wall Street uh, rally. So, uh, uh, again, Citizen United and Corp the corporatocracy. Um, what I'm wondering about is, is to, uh, what your suggestion to would be strategically, because I'm part of that group. And I'm email online right now, that group is having a discussion about whether they will continue to focus on the corporation, or will they go to a broader focus of a reform and get the money out of politics. So, I mean, and, and they seem to be talking about making a choice on which one they're going to work on. So well, I think, I, think I think the two most pernicious forces inside the Occupy movement are those who are trying to draw that energy back into the Democratic Party and the second being those who are trying to draw it into acts of violence. Um, and uh, y of course we want money out of politics, of course we want to overturn Citizens United, uh, but we, ha we have to recognize the configurations of power. Uh, there's no sense appealing to centers of power for the impossible. Um, I have sued Barack Obama and Leon Panetta over the National Defense Authorization Act and um, <laughs> We're, we're waiting to see if they'll hear it in the Southern District of New York, and some of the judges in the Southern District were pretty good on these stuff. But look, the way the Supreme Court is stacked, even if it makes it to the Supreme Court, the chances of that law being overturned are almost nil. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't try and we shouldn't do it. Um, and I, I think both I and the lawyers feel that, if nothing else, we've at least raised a kind of public awareness about the reality of this legislation, which is really, truly a terrifying piece of legislation. Um, uh, but, you know, do we want to revoke corporate personhood? Do we want electoral reform? W the fact is, given the fact that our elected officials have now become corporate employees, um, appealing to them for this kind of reform is a waste of time. And for me, a lot of the really important moral voices in this country, Wendell Berry, uh, Bill McKibben, Cornell West, um, they have all come out categorically and said civil disobedience is all we have left. And they've all been arrested, including Wendell, who's 77 years old and who occupied the governor's office in Kentucky uh, to protest mountaintop removal. So, uh, uh, you know, as Wendell Berry says, going to jail is more time than I care to donate to the U.S. government. Um, but I do think that, 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 it, that in that sense, Occupy latched on to something really important. Uh, that trying to work within the traditional mechanisms of power at this point is futile, if you're, unless you're ExxonMobil. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, I want to second the sentiment that was a wonderful talk. And I have a brief comment about the life and career of George Orwell, leading to a question about you. Um, and it's basically in the 30s, it fought in Spain, had a direct experience of industrial warfare and totalitarian movements um, and the way that they tend to operate. Came back to Britain, worked for a major media uh, organization, uh, the BBC, um, and then kind of parted ways with them and wrote uh, a novel that was a, a kind of a definitive portrait of totalitarianism um, and that led uh, to a sort of uh, popular notion of what totalitarianism 
was. And he was personally himself convinced that there was going to be a nuclear war uh, and that the world was uh, heading in a totalitarian direction. And at least in the period of his own lifetime in the several decades that followed, it didn't exactly go the way that he thought it was, but there are arguments out there that by putting out such a dark image of the future, he himself like helped to inoculate the populace against totalitarian tendencies to a certain extent, but that it was a somewhat ambiguous and double-edged uh, phenomenon in that he was also uh, you know, portraying radical movements in a way that were, to some extent, scary, in that it was a portrait of Stalinism uh, and was tied to Marxism and anarchism. And so I'm wondering, do you feel like in some of your own darker work, I have conversations about, uh, with several of my friends about your work, in that like, particularly like uh, Empire of Illusion, there's such a kind of dark image of where American society is at and the direction that it's heading, that you might be um, carrying out a, a similar sort of act and uh, possibly whether it, it might have some of the same ambivalence built into it, and that it's uh, both sort of radical and may also sort of encourage a certain sort of concern, conservatism. Well, Orwell is, you know, the, my guiding light. And um, as you know, when he came back from Spain, in homage to Catalonia, he included a chapter, and the book was published while the still was, war was still going on, about the Barcelona riots, which was the drive by uh, the Comintern, at that point, Republican government, to wipe out the anarchist, the POUM that Orwell had fought with on the Argonne Front, in fact, been shot through the neck, nearly killed and wounded. Um, and that book was, only sold 600 copies during his lifetime, and he was utterly disowned by the left because of it. Uh, because the argument was that you, uh, by exposing that event and writing about that event, betrayed la causa. And Orwell, uh, you know, repeatedly throughout his writing says, you know, the only thing I have is the truth. That, and that's my most powerful weapon. That in the short term, a lie will work. But in the long term, it destroys m my credibility and my power. Uh, and therefore, you know, he actually writes at one point that a good writer is like a window pane for the reader to see through. Um, Orwell, he, you know, he was, he was hated by the left. I mean, as you know, uh, as much as he was by the right. Um, you know, in that sense for me, he was a true radical and a great, a great intellectual. Um, his vision of 1984 was really 1948, of course, inverted. Um, it was very much a book about Stalinism. Uh, I used to wonder, okay, is Huxley right, The Brave New World, or is Orwell right, 1984? And I've come to the conclusion that they were both right. That first we got Huxley. Um, you know, first we got a wash in kind of hedonism and uh, entertainment and, uh, and the cult of the self as we were stripped of power. And now that we've been stripped of power, we get Orwell. Um, so they had different visions of totalitarianism, uh, but I think they, they both grasped a truth um, as to how uh, totalitarian systems work. It was, it was precisely that the flooding of, you know, there's a really fine book by Sheldon Wolin called Democracy Incorporated. Sheldon Wolin, uh, who was Cornell West's mentor, Cornell had dedicated his first book to Sheldon. Without question, our greatest living political philosopher, his book on de Tocqueville, um, Politics and Vision, published in 1960, is just this staggering intellectual piece of work on political theory. Um, but he writes Democracy Incorporated, and he says that the, uh, he, he calls the system we live under inverted totalitarianism, by which he means that we don't live in a classical totalitarian system ruled by a demagogue or charismatic leader, but in a system where power is expressed through the anonymity of the corporate state that in classical totalitarian regimes you have a reactionary or revolutionary party that overthrows the system and replaces it. In inverted totalitarianism you have corporate forces that 
uh, purport to pay loyalty to the Constitution, electoral politics, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and yet internally have so corrupted the levers of power as to render the citizenry impotent. And he said the, the mechanisms of control within inverted totalitarianism are credit, access to credit, and mass-produced cheap consumer products. And I actually called him and asked him if that credit's gone, because of course now the credit's drying up, certainly for the lower end of the economic scale, and those mass-produced goods are no longer cheap. Can your system of inverted totalitarianism flip? Can it become a, a system that begins to resemble classical totalitarianism? And he said without those two mechanisms of control, then there was no guarantee as to what would happen. Um, but I, I love Orwell, and um, I'll just tell, I'm talking too long about Orwell, but there's a little anecdote. When I was, I was at Harvard Divinity School, my second year, uh, the former editor of the Buenos Aires Herald, Robert Cox, who had to flee the country, came and spent a year there as, as a fellow. And I got to know him extremely well. And this was during, the, he was the editor of the paper during the Dirty War in Argentina. And he uh, would print the, uh, the, f above the fold, so at the top of the paper, he would print the names of all the desaparecidos from the night before. He was the only newspaper in Argentina to do this. He was incredibly courageous. And of course, eventually he was disappeared. And he was only gotten out because he was a British citizen. He was later knighted. Um, and the British government intervened, otherwise he would have ended like 30,000 other Argentines who never came back. And he told me when he was taken to his underground cell in the detention facility uh, that he passed on the way to the cell a huge Nazi flag that the Argentines had hugged on the wall. And I said, well, if, you know, or when you were in prison and you could have only a book or a set of books, what would it be? He said the collected letters, essays, and journalism of George Orwell, that four volume set. Um, Orwell, uh, I mean, for, for me, any, any, anybody who wants to write must read every single Orwell, word Orwell wrote. He cared about language, he had a moral core, he cared about the working class without sentimentalizing the working class. You probably read Wigan Pier. I mean, I mean, that's what Joe Sacco does, by the way, with the power of his work. He goes to Palestine and he shows you Palestine with all of its war. He doesn't cover anything up. And yet by the end, your heart is broken. Um, I don't know, has anyone here seen footnotes in Gaza? It's, I, I spent seven years in the Middle East. I was the Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times. It is one of the greatest works ever written on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, it's a graphic novel. He spent six years on it. Um, and I'll, I mean, I'll tell you, I finished it and I was just weeping. Um, and, and I think Orwell has that quality in that his bedrock honesty and integrity, um, which, which would, would mean that he would write about the Barcelona riots, uh, in the end makes him such an incredibly moral and powerful force. Um, and of course he had courage. I mean, I think when you stand up and express uncomfortable truths, and, and again, Orwell for me is a kind of model, you have to expect to be very lonely. Um, I supported Nader in 2008. And I, in fact, wrote Nader's speeches for him. I did give a talk at the University of Wisconsin and somebody said, but Nader, his talks are so boring. <laughs> but that was a very uncomfortable position to take. Even in places like Berkeley, you know, I would be booed and hissed and people would walk out and people would be angry. And you know, I went through the same thing with the Iraq war. Um, it, was, it was a very unpopular position to take. And I think, you know, for me, Orwell's the guide that you're, you know, in the end, you, you know, anybody who's a writer and anybody who, who seeks to write at least insofar as they can determine it a truth must expect finally to be very lonely and to be at certain moments hated by even the people that, uh, that or the movements that they sympathize with. Uh, and boy, that was a lesson that was really important to me. I mean, I covered the Kurds in northern Iraq, 
And uh, I was up there when the P PUK and the, and the uh, KDP were having internal, actually, gun battles. These were the two main Kurdish factions in the north. And I wrote it up, and exactly the same thing, where all of the supporters of the Kurds accused me uh, you know, of, of, of destroying the movement by writing about what was happening. Uh, and in fact, uh, I had a price on my head at the time. Um, Saddam Hussein would give anybody $1,000 for my body. Um, I had seven bodyguards, all from the town of Halapsha, which had, the poison gas had been dropped on Halapsha. We had to drive in two Jeeps, and everybody kept their AK-47s out at all times, and my driver had a pistol any time another car passed us. The idea being that if the first Jeep was ambushed, the second Jeep would be able to kill the people who had opened the ambush, and so therefore they wouldn't do it. I mean, it worked. I lost friends up there. Uh, uh, Lizzie Schmidt, a German photographer, was killed. Uh, I mean, it was nasty. And uh, I was actually in my room one night, and we, we would sleep in, in uh, a room where each of the, these Peshmerga would go in a different corner with their weapons all night, so that if somebody burst in, there was no direct line of fire. So if you shot over here, there'd be a Peshmerga there who could grab his AK. And, um, and we were listening to uh, the Kurdish broadcast out of Baghdad one night, and they were reading one of my stories about the, and the, the mood and the room got sort of very dark. Um, but in a way, you know, if you don't, if you are not exacting about your honesty, and if you don't tell everything, then you destroy the only thing you have as a writer, which is your credibility. And the power of Orwell was that you knew, you know, look, the lie of omission is still a lie. And you knew that Orwell would never engage in that lie of omission. And so when Orwell wrote about Wigan Pier, down and out in Paris and London, you understood that um, there was nothing romantic about it, nothing untrue about it. And I think that, and I think Sacco does this in Footnotes in Gaza. And by the end, these figures are not plastic, they're human. And because they're human, and because finally you can empathize with people who have human frailties and human faults, it, it gives that a kind of power. I think that by sanitizing uh, human beings, I, I think people understand to extent, even subconsciously, that, that it's not real. And I think we always have to make it real. And for me, Orwell was the exemplar of that. All those countries, you know, the, the rulers or the people in power are so different from the ones we have here. In America, we pretend to be a democracy, but when we have to protest of the war in Iraq, we have to ask permission, and then they separate people into little cages so you don't make a big noise. So I don't think that is real democracy, you know. We're being ruled by the NYPD or the mayor or the president. So, do you have, uh, one of the things that I find really hard is, you know, I'm really afraid of being jailed, you know, like coming down to the Occupy movement and getting jailed, because you are a famous person, but I'm not, and they may keep me in there much longer than you, so can you tell us what to do? <laughs> Well, that, you know, they work to make us afraid. And, and, and they're working overtime to make us afraid. I mean, anytime you fly, you know, I think it's a kind of conditioning, the TSA. Uh, and as long as we remain afraid, we remain powerless. Um, but I'm not minimizing what you're saying. Um, and you're right. Um, you know, in the end, they'll get us all. Um, but I, you know, those who have a kind of public position have a kind of protection or certainly are not mistreated. Um, and, you know, that was clear when I was arrested in front of Goldman Sachs. They didn't cuff me in front of the cameras. They cuffed me, but not till I got to the, and I got, I was out within four or five hours. And the inspector knew my name. I mean, the police inspector during the arrest came over and spoke to me by name. Um, so, yeah, you're right. You're, you're right. 
And, um, you know, it's interesting when, I don't know if you followed uh, Bill McKibben's civil disobedience when they circled the White House, remember? Um, they actually arrested uh, several people, including Bill, and they held McKibben for 52 hours in a DC jail long after they let every other protester go. And McKibben asked, why? Why am I being held? And they said, well, we have, the cops said, we have orders from up there to hold you longer. Well, of course, that came from the White House. Well, what it really came from is from the fossil fuel industry. So um, I think that you're right, but when you become a threat in the way that McKibben is perceived as a threat, um, then, then they start going after you. Uh, you know, when they actually feel threatened by these movements, they'll, they'll try and decapitate them. Uh, you know, when the undercover cops would go into Zuccotti, they would, they, the, the sort of, the way that they would, ex, you know, instantly sort of expose themselves as undercover police, aside from the fact that it was like a bad Doonesbury cartoon and they were sort of 30 and looked like they played football and said they were from Rollins College. But, <laughs> they'd ask, who are the leaders? Who do you think the leaders are? There's a great story. A woman told me that there was some undercover cop going around doing this, and they went to a medic tent and uh, said to one of the women in the medic tent, so who, who do you think, who's in charge here? Who do you think? And she goes, I am. He goes, really? He goes, uh, well, what, what are you in charge of? And she goes, everything. And he goes, and he goes well, what's your title? And she goes, God. <laughs> But I don't, I don't think that's a small concern. And uh, I, you're right. You're really right. And yet, on the other hand, as long as we remain afraid, um, it's clear that we are going to be, uh, the, the disempowerment will become worse and the dispossession will become worse. There is no stopping this force anymore unless we stop it. And if we don't stop it, then it will be a neo-feudalism where two-thirds of this country, it'll be like the proles in 1984, where you have the inner sanctum, which is like 4%, you have the outer sanctum, which is 13%, and the rest are proles. And that's what Orwell's right. I mean, that's what we'll end up as. Well, speaking of Orwell, the Citizens United decision and the resulting super PACs uh, is Orwellian, big writ large. Do you see any movement to get Citizens United repealed or changed or any kind of controls uh, on these super PACs, which are running roughshod. Right. Everything. Well, there are movements, um, but the question is, what are the chances of either the Congress or the Supreme Court? And it's zero. Um, so, you know, th there's no sense spending immense amounts of energy appealing to a system that isn't going to respond. It's like you know, writing, if only Uncle Stalin, Joe Stalin knew, you know, he'd be so shocked at what the NKVD is doing in my town. I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of like that. Do you really think it's that bad? Do you really yeah, think it's I do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, thank you for your speech. I think in many ways our perspectives are aligned, but there's one thing in which I have a different perspective than you. I suspect that you see a reformist type of capitalism as a possibility. I think that's pure utopianism. Capitalism is what it is. It is capitalism, and it is brutal. It's, your reformism is talking as if you can shave the fur off a tiger and expect the tiger not to be a tiger. I think that we have to look for another alternative besides capitalism, because capitalism is what it is. People here might remember the New Deal. And yet, who at that time, during the time when the New Deal was being established, ever had in their minds that it could be wiped away? But it is being wiped away. And with all the reformism that you seem to present, 60, 70, 100 years from now, these capitalists are going to do the same thing. They are going to have the power. They are not going to sit on their hands. And so, with this perspective, you're going to have people reinventing the wheel over and over and over again. We need another alternative. I would suggest that that alternative is socialism. Well, I, I wrote a column called Why I'm a Socialist, um, but I'm not, I'm not a Marxist. I actually gave a talk at the University of Winnipeg 
And after I finished, one of the professors stood up and there, said, I want every student to understand that he's only a radical Keynesian. Um, and it turns out that the entire economics department at the University of Winnipeg is Marxist. Um, <laughs> only in Canada, although Harper's doing his best to destroy it. Um, I, I, you know, that's a longer discussion, but you know, I lived in Europe and uh, I, I've seen, you know, a heavily controlled, I mean, Karl Polanyi, uh, whose book I would recommend, talks about a heavily controlled and constrained capitalism as being able to function with, within a social, a European kind of socialist system. Um, I mean, look, we've got to learn to live with, we've got to end this profligate consumption not only of fossil fuel, but of goods, um, because we're trashing the planet. I mean, we do have to learn to live with a new simplicity and with a new humility. Um, we have to reconfigure, we have to recreate communal structures. Um, you know, the, the food crisis, for every one degree rise in temperature, agronomists have determined there's a 10% reduction in worldwide crop yields. I mean, you know, we're headed for some really rough times uh, and creating communities with communal structures around local agriculture all of this is going to be essential but you know we'll have to spend another evening uh, about the nature of capitalism and whether it's ever it can be eradicated from human nature itself I don't know I think that we have to rebuild movements, that there's a wonderful scene in uh, one of the books about Nixon when the anti-war demonstrators have surrounded the White House and Nixon has got buses completely around the White House to protect the White House and he goes to the window wringing his hands, standing next to Henry Kissinger going, Henry, they're going to break through and get us. <laughs> that, that's precisely where we want people in power to be. Um, that it, you know, it, it, it's not our job to take power. That's, that in, in, in Karl Popper and the Open Society and his enemies' rights, that's the wrong question. The, the question is not how do you get good people to rule. The question is how do you stop the power elite from doing as much damage as possible. In Popper's words, most people attracted to power are at best mediocre, which is Obama, or venal, which is Bush. And it is movements. It is movements that keep those in power frightened. Um, you know, if Sarkozy got up and announced today that French university students would have to pay $50,000 a year and take out massive loans, they, the, the French student unions would shut the damn country down. <laughs> and that's what we, that, Sarkozy is horrible. But you know, you have to keep these people frightened. And, um, and I put my faith in movements because all of the great correctives to American democracy came through movements that never achieved formal power, uh, but forced the power. I mean, the last liberal president we had was Nixon. Not because he was a liberal, but because he was terrified. The Mine and Safety Act, the Clean Water Act, 
OSHA, it all came from Nixon, written by Nader, by the way. I, I interviewed this guy, he's 90 years old, Ken Heckler. He used to be a congressman from West Virginia. Um, he was a young speechwriter for Franklin Roosevelt. Then he was Harry Truman's speechwriter after the war. And during the war, he was in Army Intelligence, and he was signed to go to Nuremberg and interview all of the top le leaders, including Hermann Goring. Um, before they were executed. I thought, how many people on the planet knew Roosevelt, Truman, and Hermann Goring? Uh, but he told me, he fought for miners his whole life. Um, and he told me a great story that when they were pushing through the black lung uh, legislation to give miners compensation for black lung, Nixon didn't want to sign it. And so he said he held a press conference and he said, if President Nixon doesn't sign that bill by tonight, every miner in this country will go on strike immediately and the whole damn country will shut down, there'll be an energy crisis, and Nixon signed it. And Heckler said, I didn't actually know whether they were going. <laughs> That's the only way to deal with people in power. Okay, we're gonna take one more question. Your talk has led me to the darkest despair. <laughs> <laughs> Your courage is like a candle flickering in the mind. And for one, you've given me a call to 